Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. And today we'll help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions about virtual brainstorming. Virtual brainstorming really provides a great innovation advantage to hybrid and fully remote teams. You might not think of fully remote teams or hybrid teams as gaining an innovation advantage over fully in-office teams, but they do using effective brainstorming techniques. Unfortunately, lots of leaders want to return to the office full time because of these fears of losing the innovation edge. They tell me, and I've consulted for 16 companies on strategically adapting how the techniques of getting back to the office and the full future of work spectrum. So even after the pandemic, figuring out how to do all that. And they tell me that they really want to get back to the office including full-time, so they really want that full-time back in the office, especially because of this innovation advantage. They feel that they're losing that innovation when they are working full-time at home virtually during the 18 months so far of the pandemic, and they also don't want hybrid work. They're afraid that the more remote work there is, the less innovation there is. So they see that office-based culture, that Monday for Friday, 9 to 5 office-based culture, or even mostly high or even hybrid work that's three or four or five days a week, they see that as really necessary for innovation. And they reject hybrid work or virtual work. And they even push back against that, you know, the hybrid work idea, plenty of them, because of these fears. They, I mean, it's understandable. When they w experienced the lockdowns in March 2020, they imposed their in-office culture ways of doing innovation, which is brainstorming kind of, that's the main way of doing innovation in offices for team activities. So the team collaborative activity, doing brainstorming together. That's the main way of pursuing deliberate innovation, targeted innovation, where you have a topic and you want to innovate about it, you do brainstorming. So they try to do brainstorming using video conferencing. Unfortunately, that's not a good recipe for success. And we have a lot of research showing that that does not work very well. And they failed to investigate better methods. And there were plenty of better methods available before the pandemic even for doing effective virtual innovation. So that's a big problem. And that's what happened where leaders try to impose their in-office methodology on practicing innovation on the virtual environment, it didn't work, and now they're pushing for full time back in the office. That's a bad idea. And that, where's that coming from? Well, it's coming from our dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases. Been checking out with the Wise Decision Maker show for a while, you know about these cognitive biases. These are the dangerous judgment errors that come from how our mind is wired. We make bad decisions in all life areas, including about professional life and personal life and innovation that come from these cognitive biases, the way that our minds are wired. You know, our minds aren't really wired for the modern environment. They're wired for the savannah environment. When we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people, we had to survive and respond based on the fight or flight response. So of course we have that desire to be tribal, to be with each other and to be creative when we are with each other. That's for those brainstorming sessions. That's what feels good. That's what feels right. Unfortunately, that's not a good fit for the modern world. There are many, many ways where we are not very tri tribally oriented. We are in part of multipolar global complex organizations and our teams have very different people in them. And it's not a good idea to use those same impulses, the same things that work in the tribal environment to try to impose them on the modern environment. But, and I'm not saying people brainstorm that much in the tribal environment, it's those intuitions. It's what feels right. It's mistaking what feels right for what is actually right. And so it's really ironic that leaders try to impose the same ways that worked for them before um, in the office of innovating. They try to, to use traditional innovation practices in these new contexts. Kind of ironic, but that's what happens. And that comes from a cognitive bias called functional fixedness. Functional fixedness. When we develop a tool set, a way of approaching problems, of solving problems, of whether it's around innovation or anything else, we tend to apply that tool set to all other situations where we need to innovate or do something else. 
You might have heard of it as the hammer nail syndrome. You know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's a big problem because you don't adapt and seize other tools that are necessary for a situation. You know, hammer is not very good when what you need is a wrench. And leaders have been trying to use hammers for the of traditional brainstorming, imposing them on a situation where you need to use a wrench to screw in a bolt, which is the virtual video conference setting. That is not a good idea. So that is a big problem. That's functional fixedness. A related cognitive bias is called the not invented here syndrome. People, leaders really like to use practices that they came up with or that they feel comfortable with. They, they grew up with, they were taught to them. And the especially innovative practices are hard for them to accept. It's kind of, oh, this idea wasn't invented here. It's some kind of novelty. We don't want it. So we prefer practices that we develop or adapt or integrate ourselves. And that is something that we tend to reject novel practices that were created elsewhere, even if they might work a lot better than what we have right now. Now, the best practices, so those are cognitive biases you want to avoid. The best practice for returning to the office is a hybrid first model, where you have a minority of people fully remote and then a majority of people, 70 to 90%, spending one to two days in the office in a hybrid schedule. So 10 to 30% fully remote, 70 to 90%, one to two days in the office. And of the 16 companies that I worked with, 15 adopted this model. One adopted a home-centric model where they had the people working as a default from home, and then just whenever there's a need to collaborate, discuss strategy, things that they really need to do in the office, they may decide to come into the office. But there's no expectation that you come into the office at all unless there's a specific need to meet with someone and you feel the meeting will be better done in the office. And there's a lot of benefits to this model. You have retention of top talent because, you know, if you're seeing a lot of people leaving offices where that where leaders are forcing people to come back to the office, like Google, <laughs> Uber, Amazon, we're all trying to force their employees to come back to the office, trying to force them, trying to force them, trying to force them. They saw top employees leaving. They had seriously lowered retention and they had a lot of problems in this area, bad morale. And so they eventually had to change their policies and say, no, we screwed up. We're not going to force our lot of employees back to the office full time. This was a mistake. And that happened. And they each of them lost billions of this in top talent leaving, of course, in morale disengagement and in having to change their plans. And these are top companies, you know. Some this is happening at all levels of middle market companies, smaller companies elsewhere. So retention of top talent, you know, it's pretty hard to innovate when your top innovative talent has left or is demoralized, disengaged. Another benefit is a flexible company culture. So having that flexibility is very conducive to employee morale and engagement and also management of risks. When you have you know, new variants coming around, you can always go comfortably full-time back home when there's a variant that's pretty serious and it's spreading in your area. Now, so that's the how you want to get back to work. Now, traditional brainstorming, let's talk a little bit about this practice. There's definitely benefits to traditional brainstorming called things like social facilitation, where other people brainstorming, sharing ideas around you may inspire you to have some more ideas. Other benefits inc include this of uh, the idea of synergy, where having hearing other people's ideas. So separately from the people themselves, that social facilitation is other people doing things around you that's motivating. This synergy refers to learning about other people's ideas for what they're sharing may spark you to have certain ideas of your own. So it's quite useful, but it needs to be updated because recent research has shown there's a lot of problems with it. Some people, depending on their cognitive types, styles, struggle with the, these problems, especially people who tend to be introverted and who tend to be pessimistic. So they struggle with traditional brainstorming. And these problems are seriously exacerbated by remote settings, which is why traditional brainstorming is especially bad in remote settings. Now, what are the problems with traditional brainstorming? I'll talk about three problems. One is called social loafing. Social loafing. So we have social facilitation where other people's presence encourages us to brainstorm better, to do more things, because we know that they're working as part of a team together. But we also have a tendency called social loafing where the more people are around us 
the less likely we are to work hard. So the more people that there are in a brainstorming session, the less likely any specific person is to do the hard work. And so you get fewer and fewer ideas per person, the larger the size of the group. So the perfect size of the group for brainstorming is actually two people, <laughs> two people. You get that social facilitation going because you have somebody else working with you on these ideas and you don't have the social loafing. So you know and everyone is accountable that you only have one other person who is producing ideas. So this is the most effective size of a group for the maximum ideas per person. Another problem you have is production blocking. So your ideas are drowned out by other people. That's what happens when other people are talking, you have an idea, other people are talking about a different idea, and then the conversation steers that way, and it's hard for you to even remember your own idea and eventually it gets lost. That happens so often in brainstorming meetings, and that drowns out good ideas, and it's especially problematic for introverts. Introverts feel especially uncomfortable interrupting others, and they are also that there's another aspect of drowning out where introverts are much better at coming up with ideas when they're in a quiet space. So thinking of them quietly, they're not very good at coming up with ideas, not nearly as good at coming up with ideas in a more loud, buzzing space. So that's not great for introverts. Now, another problem is called evaluation apprehension. Now that's kind of what it sounds where People are afraid of being evaluated by others for coming up with crazy, off-the-wall ideas, novel ideas, or for criticizing other people's ideas, whether implicitly or explicitly. So there's that worry. And this is these negative judgments are especially problematic for do with pessimists, people who have a more negative view of the world, who have a view of the world as more full of threats than full of opportunities. Pessimists actually tend to not like sharing ideas until they've thought them through. You know, optimists, and I'm definitely an optimist myself, if you can't tell, tend to generate ideas on the fly. They're verbally processing, so they share a lot of half-baked ideas. Pessimists, on the other hand, they really want to take the time to think through an idea before sharing it, especially if they know that others will be seeing this idea. So this is a big challenge. Now, to address pessimism and optimism, to address these aspects of neurodiversity and introversion extroversion. So some already used other methods before the pandemic lockdowns. Best practices that your research has shown are really effective for brainstorming, for, do, for generating the most ideas per person. And you can use these same methods for virtual settings that they have been used by companies that have adapted strategically instead of imposing the traditional methodology on in-office settings. So let's talk about best practices. Asynchronous virtual brainstorming is the best practice that I want to share about. This is a really, really useful tool that has seven steps. So seven steps. So step one. So again, seven steps. Step one is idea generation. You want to have everyone anonymously input ideas into a digital collaboration tool that produces out a spreadsheet. I use Google Forms pretty frequently. That's a nice tool. It guarantees anonymity. Everyone knows it's anonymous. And what you can do is just have a Google Form where everyone is typing in their ideas. And for to have social facilitation, again, you want to do this independently, separately. You don't want to do this where people are in the office in the room together, so separately from each other. But you want to, for social facilitation, note everyone is working on this together. So you can have an agreed upon time that says, you know, during this hour, everyone will be sharing ideas and everyone will be inputting them. And they, of course, can think about them beforehand, but they will not be inputting them until a certain period of time. So like that certain hour, so you know everyone is working together on inputting these ideas. So that's the first step. And that anonymity, again, is very valuable to remove that evaluation apprehension, especially for people who tend to be pessimistic. They will not be as afraid, as worried, as anxious about sharing half-baked ideas. Second two step is idea cleanup. So the facilitator, so it's recommended groups have a facilitator to do this because you don't want to be both a group member and a facilitator, or you can do it with group members themselves. If there's a difficulty finding a facilitator, you remove duplicates and categorize ideas. So that's the idea cleanup, that's step two. Step three, you want that initial idea evaluation. So evaluate these ideas. So you want to comment on each of these ideas anonymously. Again, you can use Google Sheets, you get that Google spreadsheet spit out, you clean it up, 
and then each team member goes through and comments on each idea. So just using the comment feature. And again, you can do it anonymously, just create a throwaway email. So comment on each idea anonymously, and you also rate on a scale of zero to five the novelty and practicality of each idea. A novelty, obviously, you know, how novel it is. Practicality means how easy and pragmatic it would be to implement. So difficult, easy, so on. Then you have revised idea generation. Now you've seen everyone's ideas, and that's great. And you've had a chance to go through them and share your own thoughts on the comment on them and evaluate them. Then you want to revise the idea. So have a revised idea generation process. So you're adding to your initial ideas and also inspired by other people's ideas and their comments on your ideas, you have a revised idea, so new ideas. So generate new ideas. Again, it's like step one, inputting anonymously into a spreadsheet. Then clean this up, step five, that's revised idea cleanup, same thing. And then step six is revised idea evaluation again commenting and rating and novelty and practicality. And finally, step seven is having a meeting. That's a synchronous meeting, which you, for virtual teams, you have virtually. For hybrid teams, I recommend you have that in person. But again, avoid doing the other steps in office. This is the one step where for hybrid teams, you can do it in the office. Otherwise, you'll have production blocking and evaluation apprehension as serious issues. So you don't want to go into that. Now, why is this better than traditional brainstorming? Why do I say that? You know, why did some people use it even before the pandemic? Because it generates, just by the research, very clearly shows that it generates more novel ideas, both more ideas and more novel ideas. So compared to the same type group doing the traditional brainstorming, asynchronous virtual brainstorming generates more ideas to get all in, together a total of ideas and more ideas that are rated as more novel. And it avoids that production blocking problem and avoids evaluation apprehension. So that's great. It's anonymous. So no evaluation apprehension avoids the production blocking because, you know, you don't have that issue of people speaking over of people speaking over each other, being worried about interruption or having difficulty focusing in that environment. Everyone can go into an environment they like, you know, introverts can go into a co-working space where other people are working if they want the sound of other people working and chatting around them or in a cafe, right? It's especially beneficial for larger groups. So the larger the group is, the more beneficial it is to use because you don't have that social loafing since you can have software just track how many people people submitting in each idea. So you can track the number of ideas per person so each person stays accountable. Now, some other benefits of choosing asynchronous virtual brainstorming is that neurodiversity. You can engage very diverse team members and facilitate their idea creation. So it balances those preferences for introverts and extroverts and for optimists and pessimists. So that's why I strongly recommend that you use asynchronous virtual brainstorming to seize an innovation advantage for virtual and hybrid teams. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. And please follow us on the YouTube if you check this out in video or on Apple iTunes if you checked out the podcast or any other podcast delivery platform. Leave your comment if you can leave a comment. But, and please, of course, rate the show. We'd love to hear your ratings. And of course, recommend us to your friends and family and share on social media. That's a great compliment you can give to any podcast. I'd love to hear your feedback. Please email me at gleb at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Again, gleb at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. And check out all of our other resources at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Blogs, podcasts, videocasts, online courses, books, coaching, training, and so much more. All right, everyone. I hope this episode helps you make wise and profitable decisions. Until next time, I look forward to seeing you on the next show.